This episode is sponsored by Dashlane. Get a 30-day free trial and after that get a 10% discount using our code GEOGRAPHICS at dashlane.com forward slash GEOGRAPHICS. And let's get into it. Seen from the air, it is a narrow green band snaking its way between mountains and over rivers. Seen from the ground, it's a four kilometer wide tract of pristine wilderness sandwiched between fences bristling with barbed wire. Stretching for 240 kilometers, it completely bisects the Korean peninsula, chopping this once united nation clean in two. Known as the Demilitarized Zone, or DMZ for short, it's the line separating hyper capitalist South Korea from isolated communist North Korea. It's also the most heavily guarded border in the world. Created in the last days of the Korean War, the DMZ was meant to be a temporary fix until lasting peace could be achieved. Instead, though, it became a symbol of one of the longest wars in history. History. Surrounded by landmines, watched over by armed guards, and illegal to cross without special permission, the DMZ is also a place thrumming with history where the future of Asia could one day be decided. Today on Geographics, we're slapping on our helmets, strapping on a bulletproof vest, and taking you across the world's most dangerous border. When talking about the place billed as the most dangerous border, there should be two questions on everybody's lips. How did it get there? And why is it so dangerous? And no, the answers are not politics and all the landmines, you massive dum-dum. To get the real answers, we need to go all the way back to 1905. That was the year the Japan-Korea Treaty turns the Korean Empire into a mere protectorate of Imperial Japan. Five years later, the Japanese decided even being a mere protectorate gave the Koreans too much leeway and they annexed the peninsula outright. And that's how things would have stayed had Japan not got involved in a little something called World War II. Historical spoiler alert here, the Japanese lost. Indeed, they lost so hard that they lost their empire. In August 1945, two inexperienced aides in the U.S. State Department were given the task of redrawing Japanese Korea. The young men, they got out a map and they drew a line along the 38th parallel, cleaving the peninsula into a zone of Soviet occupation and a zone of American occupation. Those two zones became the countries of North Korea and South Korea. But now let's skip ahead a bit to 1949. By now, the Cold War had started and the US and the USSR were no longer even pretending to work together. In Korea, this had led to the rise of two dictators, Syngman Rhee in the South, reluctantly backed by America, and Kim Il-sung in the North, reluctantly backed by the USSR. There, the balance could have probably held had it not been for the events of October the 1st. On that day, Mao Zedong's forces completed their takeover of China. Suddenly, communist North Korea had a new ally on its northern border. It was this development, more than anything, that would turn the Korean War into a bloodbath. Although they had their own countries, both Syngman Rhee and Kim Il-sung were unhappy. Each wanted to reunify Korea, and their respective armies kept clashing along the 38th parallel. On June 25, 1950, one of those clashes turned into a full-on North Korean invasion. Despite our modern view of North Korean troops as malnourished peasants wielding antiquated weapons, North Korea's troops in the 1950s were better armed, better trained, and better fed than their southern counterparts. Rhee's armies fled before the onslaught. About to lose the war, Rhee had no choice but to call in Uncle Sam. With help from the United States, the South drove the North's army back across the 38th parallel, across North Korea, and all the way up to the Chinese border. Once again, it seemed like the war was destined to end, this time in the South's favor. But then Chairman Mao sent three million Chinese troops in to support the North, and, well, everything went nuts again. By 1951, the two sides were essentially back where they started at the 38th parallel, only now millions of people were dead. With the war a quagmire, both the USA and the USSR decided that it was time to end the damn thing. They bludgeoned their respective allies into sending representatives to the Korean village of Panmunjom to negotiate a ceasefire. Little did either the Americans or the Soviets know it, but peace would elude them for decades. A 
Assuming you stayed awake in history class, you're probably thinking something along the lines of, well, hold on a minute, didn't the Korean War end in 1953 and not 1951? Unfortunately, you're right. Although the negotiations were started in July of 1951, they were disrupted by endless North Korean stalling tactics. Sometimes these tactics verged on the childish. When US negotiators first arrived in Panmunjom, they discovered they'd been given tiny chairs that made them look small and ridiculous. But other problems were more intractable. Although the front lines had more or less returned to the 38th parallel, they were a few kilometers short of it. That meant any cessation of fighting would leave the North with a few hundred square kilometers less territory than it had before Kim's invasion. The negotiations dragged by, on and off, for the next two years. In that time, millions of Koreans were killed alongside hundreds of thousands of Chinese and tens of thousands of Americans. It's possible this stalemate could have continued forever, had it not been for two major world events. The first was an increase in US nuclear capability, with new warheads that could be fired rather than dropped by planes. The second took place in a dacha outside of Moscow. Joseph Stalin's death on March 5, 1953 was a huge event, but its impact on the Korean War was doubly huge. The Soviet Union had essentially been bankrolling China, which had, in turn, been supporting North Korea. With Stalin gone, Mao had no idea if his eventual successor would turn off the taps. So, less than a month after Stalin passed away, Beijing contacted the US. This time, they were ready to negotiate for real. But, in fact, it wasn't quite as clear-cut as that. While the Chinese, North Koreans, and Americans were all now eager to end the war, Syngman Rhee in the South refused, loudly declaring the conflict would never end until it unified the entire peninsula. To that end, the US had to buy them off with promises of massive economic aid and a mutual defense pact. Finally, on 1953, an armistice was signed. While it didn't officially end the Korean War, it did stop the fighting. That day, both sides pulled their troops back two kilometers, creating a four kilometer wide demarcation line where all weapons, military, and acts of aggression would hence forth be outlawed. Known as the demilitarized zone, this four kilometer wide strip of land was meant to be a temporary solution, driving a wedge between the combatants until a peace agreement could be reached. But it never was. Negotiations were broken off for good not long after, and a formal peace was never concluded. Rather than being a temporary fix, the DMZ would stand in place for the next 65 years. Now that we've discussed the why, it's time to discuss the what. As in, what exactly is the DMZ? Well, that's a complicated question. The obvious answer is the stuff you can get off Wikipedia. The DMZ is a four kilometer wide piece of land running 240 kilometers across the Korean peninsula. But you're not here for a brief summary of Wikipedia, so that means we need to dig a bit deeper. And once you start digging, the DMZ, well, it becomes all kinds of interesting. The first thing is that it is obviously dangerous. There are some estimated 1.2 million landmines on the South Korean side of the DMZ and another 800,000 on the North Korean side. Because these were laid in haste to stop another invasion, no one's actually sure where they are. Neither side kept good maps, and six decades of torrential rain hasn't helped. Every year, the rains wash at least a few North Korean mines into South Korea, something leading to big and, well, rather exciting explosions. Because of incidents like this, the South Korean side of the DMZ also includes an additional 10-kilometer stretch of protected area. Just like how the Chernobyl reactor today is surrounded by three different buffer zones, all requiring increasingly higher clearance to enter, so South Korea's side of the DMZ is buffered by the civilian control zone. Presumably this is to stop drunken South Korean frat boys from trying to climb into North Korea and give Kim Jong-un a swelly. Still, the civilian control zone is not as lifeless as the DMZ. A few tens of thousands of people live here in spitting distance of the north. And this brings us to our next fascinating point about the DMZ itself. It's not totally devoid of humans. Within the DMZ, both South Korea and North Korea maintain villages designed to entice those watching from across the border to defect. In South Korea, this village is Taesong Dong, known to the US as Freedom Village. Only about 200 people live in Freedom Village, all of whom presumably consider the name really ironic because freedoms are rather limited there. For example, there's a strict 11 p.m. curfew and it's forbidden to relocate. Additionally, women who marry outsiders aren't allowed to have their husbands move there. This is because inhabitants of Freedom Village are also free from having to pay taxes or do military service, and Seoul doesn't want the entire male population moving there to avoid boot camp. But if Taesong Dong is strange, well, wait until you hear about North Korea's version. Sitting just 1.6 kilometers from Freedom Village, Ki Jong Dong Peace Village appears at first glance to be just a regular Korean hamlet. But look closer, 
and it tells a whole different story. First, you might notice that Peace Village has round-the-clock electricity, something not even guaranteed in Pyongyang. Second, you might notice there's no glass in any of the windows. And finally, you might realize that although you see people wandering around, all of them seem to be sweepers or repairmen. That's right, Kajongdong is a Potemkin village, a fake settlement built purely to fool outsiders. But even though Kajongdong is empty, that hasn't stopped both Seoul and Pyongyang from using it for propaganda purposes. In the early 1980s, the South Koreans installed a new flag flagpole at Taesong Dong. Standing in nearly 100 meters, it dominated the landscape, a visual reminder of Seoul's dominance. So what did Pyongyang do? Well, they built a 150-meter flagpole in Kijong Dong. Once again, geopolitics reduced to a metaphorical Dong measuring contest. But it's not just the humans living in the DMZ who make it such a fascinating place. And with this, it's time we met a few of the zone's other inhabitants. But just before we do, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Dashlane. Now, you might not need to secure your country's borders, but you do need to secure your identity, and the absolute best way to do that is with Dashlane. And I want to tell you about them before we get into the rest of today's video. Dashlane is a one-stop shop for all of your digital identity protection needs. If all of your passwords are the same, it's a bad idea. You can use Dashlane's password manager to create and securely store complex and unique passwords, making it much less likely that your accounts are going to get compromised. They also have a VPN as part of their service, meaning you can browse the internet securely and confidently, even when you're out on public Wi-Fi. But it's not just that, they also actively monitor the dark web to see if your information has been leaked somewhere, and that means that you can go in and change your passwords before someone breaks into other accounts that share that same password. Plus, Dashlane, it does what it's always done, it stores your passwords, it keeps your personal data secure, it fills all of those annoying boxes for payment info or passwords for you. Now, a lot of Dashlane is absolutely free, but there are some premium upgrades you can buy. To see if those are right for you, you can get a 30-day free trial and after that a 10% discount using our code geographics at dashlane.com forward slash geographics. It's also a great way to support the show. Uh, let's get back to it. Unless you've been watching this video while sipping in and out of consciousness after a night down the pub, you'll probably remember how we briefly compared the DMZ to Chernobyl. Well, it's not just in its layers of control zones that the Korean border resembles Ukraine's nuclear accident site. In both cases, humans have been prevented from living there for decades. And what happens when you get a place without humans? Well, the animal kingdom explodes. Over 65 years on from its creation, the DMZ is now one of the most pristine tracts of wilderness in the whole of Asia. Within this narrow corridor, you can find untouched wetlands, virgin forests, and mountains that haven't seen a human footprint since Eisenhower was in the White House. The result has been the accidental creation of one of the world's greatest wildlife parks. Although researchers aren't allowed into the DMZ, those monitoring it from the civilian control zone have reported seeing musk deer, spotted seals, Asiatic black bears and long-tailed gorils. There have even been reports of tigers, an animal thought to have gone extinct on the Korean peninsula a century ago. While all estimates as to their numbers are purely speculative, the fact that they're there at all suggests something kind of awkward for us humans. Two million landmines, vast tracts of barbed wire, and constant military incursions are apparently less damaging to wildlife than a lot of us just moving in and opening up a 7-Eleven. It's actually the DMZ's natural wonders that could be one of the biggest obstacles to lasting peace. The fear is that if relations are ever normalized, development will go wild in the DMZ, killing its endangered species. It's telling that in 2019, North and South Korea launched a joint bid to have the DMZ declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site, offering it legal protections should the countries ever unify. Still, that might be a long way off yet. While today it might look like North and South Korean tensions are easing, the two countries have a long and not-so-glorious history of goading one another across the DMZ. Occasionally, these provocations have actually taken them to the brink of war. In January 1968, the four Wu brothers were chopping wood on the South Korean side of the DMZ when they stumbled across a bedraggled group of soldiers. Although they were dressed in South Korean uniforms, the 31 men all looked malnourished and spoke with curious accents. Eventually, one of the brothers asked, Are you gentlemen from the North? Yes, comrades, their leader replied. We're here to liberate you. 
What the Wu brothers had accidentally uncovered was a Pyongyang plot to assassinate South Korea's dictator Park Chung-hee and ignite a war that could lead to a communist victory. Fortunately, the North Korean captain tasked with carrying out this plan wasn't the brightest bulb in the box. When his soldiers suggested they kill the Wu brothers, he refused, saying the ground was frozen and it would take too long to bury them. So instead, he made the brothers sign a contract that basically said, I, the undersigned, promise not to immediately run to the police and tell them that this gang of North Korean idiots are trying to assassinate the president. Then, once he was signed, he let the brothers go. And presumably, he watched with a crestfallen expression as all four ran into the nearest police station to tell them exactly what was going on. Yet, despite the North Korean captain committing such a cartoonish blunder, the South Korean cops they failed to arrest them. Somehow, the North Koreans waved through checkpoint after checkpoint until they were deep in the heart of Seoul. It wasn't until the assassins were literally 300 meters from the Blue House, the South Korean White House, that a policeman thought to check out their story. When it immediately fell apart, the North Koreans they started shooting. By the time the dust settled over that Seoul street, a hundred people were dead. Of the 31 North Koreans, one made it back over the DMZ alive and became a national hero. Another surrendered to the South Korean authorities. Back in Pyongyang, his parents and six siblings were tried for his surrender and they were all executed. While the Blue House Raid, as it came to be known, is the action movie story of DMZ crossings, there are other and even goofier tales. Take, for instance, the tale of the tree. In August 1976, a poplar tree in the DMZ grew so big that it blocked the view from a South Korean guard post. So the South informed the North that it was going to trim back the branches, and they sent in a contingent of men overseen by two American officers, Arthur Boniface and Mark Barrett. As the tree was being pruned, a North Korean patrol came past. The captain watched the work for some time, then suddenly ordered his men to take the tree pruning equipment. A tussle broke out, and Boniface and Barrett were both killed with axes. It was obvious to the survivors that the North was indulging in a show of strength, one meant to scare off the Americans. But you should only get into a wrestling match with Uncle Sam if you're sure you're going to win. A couple of days later, North Korean guards watched open-mouthed as the joint American-South Korean response came. 300 troops got Guarded by a dozen attack helicopters, marched into the DMZ while fighter jets and B-52 bombers droned overhead. There, in full view of the North Koreans, the soldiers calmly and methodically chopped down the poplar tree, leaving only a stump. This time, the North Koreans didn't intervene. By this stage in the video, you're probably feeling a bit like, well, that really is a tough border. And well, you'd be right. But that's not to say that the DMZ is some Game of Thrones style impenetrable wall keeping the White Walkers of Communism out of Westeros and, well, you know, let's just abandon that metaphor. The point is the DMZ is crossable. Not often and rarely legally, but probably more than you think. One way, of course, is to cross by tunnel. In the 1970s, North Korean defectors told Seoul about the existence of tunnels beneath the DMZ. The South Koreans managed to uncover four of them, known today as the Tunnels of Aggression. While we tend to associate border tunnels with smuggling, these four tunnels were something else. Wide enough to accommodate soldiers marching side by side, it's said that they could have funneled 30,000 North Korean troops into South Korea every hour in the event of an invasion. For their part, the North Koreans said they were coal mines, even going so far as to smear coal dust on the walls. The four tunnels have now been blocked off, but at least a dozen others are thought to exist, so if you were desperate to cross the DMZ, well, that's one way you could do it. Another way would be to swim. Yes, swimming across the DMZ is totally Totally possible thanks to the border at points following the path of the Han River. In fact, one North Korean soldier defected by swimming as recently as 2017, but that doesn't mean the traffic is all one way. In 2014, an American in South Korea tried to swim across to the north, apparently hoping that he could talk Kim Jong-un into a lasting peace deal. Unsurprisingly, that did not happen. He was pulled out of the water and arrested by South Korean troops. But if all that sounds a little off-putting, well, you could always try walking. Over the decades, a small number of North Koreans have actually walked into the south across the DMZ, missing the mines just by sheer luck. But of all the ways to get across the DMZ, this is probably the worst. There's a reason why nearly all North Koreans defect across the Chinese border, and that's because they stand a much better chance of surviving. Okay, but that's the illegal crossings. What if you wanted to cross legally? Well, that's a little trickier. If you take a tour group into the DMZ, you'll get as far as Panmunjom, remember, where the armistice was negotiated. But you'll not actually cross. 
That is, unless you're planning to travel by rail. In 2018, the Kim regime invited South Korean engineers to investigate the country's aging railways. The purpose of the visit was laying the groundwork for a future train link across the DMZ. Seoul envisages a future where three lines, one on each coast plus one down the middle, link the two Koreas. To be clear, this is a very long way off and it will involve both a massive engineering feat and also massive geopolitical challenge. Still, a symbolic first train did cross the DMZ in December of 2018. While no commercial services are available yet, Seoul ultimately wants to link its rail network to Pyongyang's network that runs into China and from there into the rest of the world. One day, it may be possible to get inside a train in Moscow and not get off until you've arrived in South Korea, a journey that would make the Orient Express look like a kiddies toy train ride. All of this raises an interesting question. How much longer will the world's most dangerous border actually last? Well, it's hard to say. Over the last couple of years, we've seen things that would have previously been unthinkable. Kim Jong-un and South Korea's President Moon joking together like BFFs, the President of the United States casually wandering across the DMZ and into North Korea. It could be that in five years' time, this video looks almost comically out of date, people watching asking, what DMZ? Thanks to the endless depths of human cruelty and mistrust, North and South Korea managed to accidentally create one of the greatest wildlife refuges in Asia. Within its narrow limits, the DMZ is both a park and a memorial, a graveyard for troops from the North, the South, the USA, and China, whose bodies have never been repatriated. More than that, it's a reminder too. A reminder of a historic mistake when a line on a map created the conditions for a horrific war. Even if the physical need for the DMZ vanishes, maybe the psychological need will remain. A marker that will remind future generations of Koreans of what once happened here. It may be the world's most dangerous border, but the DMZ is more than just a line in the sand. It's the line between two ideologies, two visions for the world. Whether or not that line can ever be crossed is something only time will tell. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Just click that button below now. Also, when you're subscribing, do hit the notification bell because then you actually know when we put out a new video, which is nice. Also, why not check out our sister channel, Biographics. This channel is about places. That channel is about people. So please go over, subscribe to that as well. And as always, Thank you for watching.